Greetings, friends. Welcome to the second part of the four-part series on innovation. This was originally planned as a half-day session for a short-term TQIP Teachers Education Quality Improvement Program course at Manit, Maulana Azad National Institute of Technology, Bhopal. As usual, I had over-budgeted the material at the end of the program, I realized there were yet more things I wished to communicate which I could not have done in the allotted time. Further, I had promised the attendees that I will be putting up the video with all the slides and, and more on my YouTube channel. So here is the full coursework of my part of the program. The actual session was split in two and the date of delivery for the first part uh, was February 15th and the second and third were presented on February 19th. The four parts as I propose uh, to upload on my YouTube channel will be part one, creativity and innovation. I've already uploaded that. Second one will be uh, this one, knowledge and dogma. Third, hopefully, will be visions and case study. And fourth will be money, prima innova. Part 1 established the definitions of creativity and innovation and delineated the necessity, differentiation and examples of the two. Additionally, it gave examples of organizations and nations that have made themselves successful through innovation in recent times. This part also gave a brief discussion on what could be the possible causes of modern Indians failure at innovation while in India. This is the what, the why, and the who of innovation. Just a few more points. Once again, I apologize for the poor quality of narration. Uh, my head doesn't work when I don't have audience in front of me. So either I need to script my narration or I need to have audience uh, in front of me. In this particular case, I had neither. So I'm sorry for the pathetic quality of the narration and the discussion, but I think it's important there, therefore I've put it. Um, just one more point before I wind up the introduction. I have not mentioned culture of entitlement. This is also, I feel, one of the problems that we Indians have. Uh, that could also be the reason for our non-innovation in recent times. But then if that's the case, why are we good at jugaad? Why are we good at improvisation? We are wonderful at the art of make-do. Yet, when it comes to structured, quality-wise, high-quality uh, innovation, we never seem to be able to do it. So, on to my analysis of what could possibly be our problem. Thanks for watching this presentation so far. I'm going to try your patience and try it well. So, <laughs> in case you last till the end, I'll see you then. Thank you for being there. A disclaimer first. Nobody can really teach anyone anything. The best any speaker can do is to really assist the listeners in thinking. Innovation part two. Knowledge and dogma. In this part two we will be studying the main reason why companies and organizations and individuals and e indeed nations fail to innovate. We'll have a few more definitions and then we will address what I believe is the primary enemy of innovation. We had ended part one on this slide and we were wondering whether this last question has any specific relevance to our inability to innovate 
these days. The question, do we prefer dogma over knowledge? But before that, we will revisit one of the slides that we saw in part one. There, it had three circles. Here, we have only two circles. We are looking at the intersection between technical creativity and economic feasibility. So, before we go any further, let's look at some of the definitions. Now, the definition of technology. Most of us already know that, but a quick recap. Oxford says, the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, especially in industry. So, fundamentally, technology is applied science. Moving on. So, now, the definition of economy. Oxford says, the state of a country or a region in terms of the production and consumption of goods and services and the supply of money. Mm, it's a very learned definition. I don't like it. It's something which, uh, you know, Nobel laureates and people doing deal it and all those kind of people mouth. For me, the definition which is more sensible one is careful management of available resources. Wikipedia gives us the background on this word. The English words economy and economics can be traced back to the Greek words oikonomos, that is the one who manages a household. A composite word derived from oikos, that is house, and nemo. Yes, nemo. Uh, manage or distribute and economia or household management. The first recorded sense of the word economy is in the phrase the management of economic affairs found in a work possibly composed in a monastery in 1440. Economy is later recorded in more general sense including thrift and administration. So for me Economy is really management of resources, management of one's household, thrift, administration. That's what economy is all about. It's not really that difficult thing which it is pre presented us as, possibly because people don't want us to know and understand economy. Moving on. So the next definition feasible. Ah, simple. That's likely, probable, able to be made, done or achieved. So now let's look at the slide again. The intersection between technical creativity and economic feasibility. So what is it? And before we get to what it is, what does it get us? What do we gain if we are able to successfully dwell in this space, in this intersection where this question mark is? Well, simple. We get money. Yes, absolutely. If we are creative in the marketplace what do we get the money which actually is the greatest what innovation we have said that money is almost certainly the greatest innovation that humans have made the most important innovation the most impactful innovation which human beings have come up with and why do I say this more on this in a later part innovation the definition of which is the development of new customer value through solutions that meet new or inarticulate needs the keywords being new 
and customer value. So back to this intersection. Now that we know what we get, what is it? Innovation. So now an important question. How to kill innovation? This question is important because we have been doing it successfully for some time. We've been killing innovation very effectively in our society. How do we manage to do it? How are we so good at it? Let's have a look. We get to the slide that we ended part one with and we began part two of innovation series with. The question, why don't we innovate anymore? And we were wondering, is it because we prefer dogma over knowledge? Well, time for some more definitions. Knowledge, what is it? Oxford says, facts, information and skills acquired through experience or education, the theoretical or practical understanding of a subject. Wikipedia says knowledge is a familiarity. It says it can include facts, information, descriptions or skills through experience or education. Lots of words, lots and lots of words. Let's try some other definition. Might be easier. Well, the definition of dogma. Oxford says a principle, a set of principles laid down by authority as incontrovertibly true. Ooh, big word, incontrovertibly true. I think we need a definition for that. Well, basically it means beyond doubt. Other keywords, fixed, accepted without any doubts of particular group or organization, opinion, belief imposed upon others. Well, let's see if we can compare these two things, knowledge and dogma with each other and see if there is any difference between the two. After all, we are saying that it's a key difference and that it matters a lot and that it has mattered a lot in our recent history. Well, Here's the comparison between knowledge and dogma. Knowledge versus dogma. Slide one. Well, quite a few points. Um, da, 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 yeah, I've read the whole slide. I mean, of course, I've made it, so I've read it. I'm sure you've read it by now. Let's move on to the next slide. All right, so knowledge versus dogma. Slide two. Again, lots of points. You see, when I sat down to compare the two, I got so many points. Uh, I don't know, I just got overwhelmed. I just couldn't put all of them in one slide. So I used two slides. Anyway, by now you've read the second slide also. So we can move on, right? <laughs> no, just kidding. Actually, we will move on. But each of those points on slide one and slide two, we'll try and address uh, through a slide of its own through examples through pictures so that we are able to understand this better so moving on to specific points now so the first and the most important difference between knowledge and dogma is that knowledge always is falsifiable and dogma is not what is falsifiability? Falsifiability means that it is possible to prove something wrong. Somebody asserts something, he or she asserts it in such a way that it is possible for you to prove that it is wrong. That is the cornerstone of all knowledge. Knowledge cannot exist without falsifiability. Now, if you look at what a falsifiable model is, it means that you have a model, you have a description, an understanding of reality. From that, you make a prediction. 
and then you say this prediction can be tested in this way and if the test comes out positive then your model is right so I say sun rises every day and I say I predict that the sun will rise tomorrow and the test will be that you and I will get up in the morning before sunrise and look east and if the sun rises if the test is positive then my assertion is right okay or I assert that you die if you put your neck under a running train that is between the rails and the wheels of a running train that's the model I make the prediction I put my neck there you know if I die then my model is correct so that's one part of the falsifiable model you have a few predictions and tests for each of those predictions and if they're positive then you know that the model is supported but you also have a counter prediction so you say that if this happens you have a test for that too and you say if this happens then the model can be falsified that the model is wrong or at least it's not exactly correct that some work needs to be done on that model maybe it has to be changed completely maybe not maybe just some tinkering needs to be done with that but either way unless you are able to uh, you're able to express or define your model of reality in terms of things which can actually fail it which can actually prove that it is a wrong model which can falsify it you can't really be laying claim to have advanced knowledge because necessarily knowledge must be falsifiable that's how knowledge moves forward dogma on the other hand is exactly opposite the moment you start you know you try to falsify something about a dogma and you will have a lot of dogs and a lot of dogmas coming and you know uh, eating you off uh, you know um, uh, in Hindi we would say aapke bote bhar ke le I mean so dogma doesn't like being falsified that is the key difference now the key difference knowledge is peer reviewed and evaluated now like I said if I say sun rises every day then I have to talk to you you as my friend as my peer as a person co extant in the same time and place <coughs> I'm sorry so knowledge has to be reviewed what I claim has to be reviewed by you and evaluated by you if I succeed in that if I pass your review and evaluation if I am able to pass through all those you know all those geeks with uh, with swords and what have you on my way and I'm able to re re reach across that's when my assertion will be accepted and that's the way knowledge is advanced in today's world in fact in any world unless others are able to repeat what I say happens when I say happens then it is not a knowledge like I say if you are able to put your neck under a running train between its rails and the wheels and you come out unscathed then then what I have said is wrong right so that's the only way knowledge moves forward 
dogma on, on the other hand is laid down by authority because somebody turns at me and says this is correct because I said so or because Mr. X said so because so and so God said so because so and so guru said so because so and so prophet said so because so and so son of God said so because so and so great writer said so because Marx said so and so on and so forth so that's the key difference another key difference between knowledge and dogma well there was a time when there used to be alchemists you know early chemists who used to try to do lots of things one of the things that they are famous for is trying to turn lead into gold um, now of course theoretically that is possible the only thing is that the amount of energy you need to put in that and the m amount of expenses you run uh, trying to do that uh, you really it's really no point uh, turning lead into gold I mean uh, it's just a nuclear reaction right so it is possible but historically I don't think any of the alchemists really were able to do that so the point where alchemy actually turned to chemistry was when people started describing what they were doing and others were able to repeat those experiments I said you know add um, you know hydrogen chloride and sodium hydroxide uh, you'll have a reaction and then you'll have some salt and some water so fine that way I am able to create some salt if I can describe how it works and if you can do it then it's proven that's when peer review is successful that's when you have repeated what I said that's when alchemy becomes chemistry I'm sorry for taking all the fun out of that that cartoon but moving on but no before we move on I said hydrogen chloride how many people thought that I said something wrong maybe I did maybe I did not I don't know check it out because hydrogen chloride refers to the gas which when dissolved in water makes hydrochloric acid which is what we normally mix with sodium hydroxide so this is how knowledge progresses having said hydrogen chloride having recorded it I went back to figure out what I said wrong well you need to find out whether hydrogen chloride as a gas can directly be piped into sodium hydroxide solution what is going to be the reaction like this is how knowledge progresses it doesn't just progress because I said that hydrogen chloride reacts with sodium hydroxide to form salt and water difference between knowledge and dogma the other key difference between knowledge and dogma is that knowledge is achieved through effort and dogma imposed by diktat Buddha as far as I know never said this is what life is this is what you must believe this is what you must follow he said I studied life and I came up with these conclusions see if they make sense to you do your own experiments and come up with your own conclusions that is what is knowledge 
on the other hand bajrang dal comes up and says valentine's day is non indian you can't celebrate it and why you can't celebrate it because we say so so we're going to trouble you if you celebrate valentine's day so there the difference between knowledge and dogma something achieved through effort something else imposed by diktat my friend albert says the case is never closed well knowledge is always open to doubt albert einstein said many experiments may prove me right but it takes only one to prove me wrong another way falsifiability can be expressed but more than falsifiability here is a belief system which says that knowledge must always be open to doubt because that's the only way to progress unless you doubt yourself unless you doubt what is placed before you as a fact you can never know the facts you can never know reality you can never know truth your model of reality can never be i don't want to use the word perfect but it cannot be true enough unless it is always open to doubt that was knowledge what does dogma do dogma is never open to doubt let's say if i am in the process of establishing a new dogma i don't know let's say swanism like marxism or hansa dharma like you know any dharma that you want to talk about and this states this dharma states that you got to repeat one mantra and if you repeat all your life if you spend 50% of your waking life in repeating the statement swanza white swanza white swanza white swanza white swanza white swanza white then in after life you'll get everything that you ever desired so that's a good dogma right wrong because while swans all over the world europe and wherever else you find swans have always been white until somebody located some black swans in australia what happened to swans of white swans of white really no they no more are however a dogma will refuse to accept that because it is never open to doubt and that's where you can actually look at the various dogmas around you and figure out that many of them stick to their swans of white mantra despite the fact that black swans have been discovered knowledge loves being questioned dogma hates being questioned so you tell a scientist that his favorite his most favorite theory is wrong because of so so and so evidence he's going to be very happy a true scientist is going to thank you because he would say oh i was believing in something wrong all along thank you for correcting me a truly knowledgeable person always welcomes all kinds of questions on the other hand dogmatic people only allow you some kind of questions there are several kinds of questions which you simply cannot ask knowledge is anekantavadi 
believes others may also be right remember this elephant from part one however dogma is a kantavadi believes only i am right knowledge is flexible adaptable dogma is fixed brittle and this is exactly what happens to the trees and to knowledge and dogma that which is flexible and adaptable flourishes yes it has to tra face trouble every once in a while but it's able to continue living fixed and brittle stuff like dogma eventually dies its well-deserved and hopefully early death knowledge when there is an agreement when both the people are on the same side then in knowledge there is agreement there is corroboration you are two equals shaking hands agreeing in dogma there is only acceptance and obedience like the dog there you're always the dog when you're following dogma knowledge is universal to all humankind dogma is specific to a group if the sun will rise tomorrow it will rise tomorrow for all of us if I put my finger in a live electricity socket and ground myself on the other side and there is no insulation then in that case I'm gonna get a shock you're gonna get a shock a Ukrainian is gonna get a shock a Bangla speaker is going to get a shock. Somebody living on Papua New Guinea is going to get a shock. It's universal to all humankind. Dogma is specific to a group. So if Jesus is the son of God, he is so only for a specific group. And if Hazrat Muhammad is a prophet, he is so only for a different group. And if Mirza Ghulam Ahmad is also a prophet or, or whatever the terminology they use for him, the Ahmadis, then only for them he is the prophet. So dogma is specific to a group this is also true of secular dogmas say for example marxism say for example free marketism moving on discoveries are lifeblood for knowledge like the earth is fear discoveries are not possible in dogma like for example for creationists that is the dogmatic Christians the earth is only 6,000 years old for them it has not yet been discovered that the earth which is a sphere has been in existence for much much longer than 6000 years they're still sitting on top of their favorite tortoise on a disc for knowledge inventions are welcome for dogma invention 
is evil. I respect the Amish a lot, but then they just don't like many modern inventions. Innovation that we are celebrating today, that we are talking about right now, that we are learning how to do. For knowledge, innovation is a positive word, but for dogma, innovation is a negative word. For example, in Arabic, innovation is translated into bida, which is something evil. Why? Because the perfect system has already been granted. All you need to do is turn the pages of the Quran or at the most look at the life of the Prophet and you have everything there. What do you need any innovations for? Who cares about the stuff that was not available at that time? So people wonder whether it is proper to be eating mangoes, whether it is proper to be doing, I don't know, heroin, I guess. That's possibly the reason why the strongly Islamic Afghans actually don't have much problems with drug running. Innovation negative for dogma. Knowledge is evidential. Give evidence except something is true. Dogma on the other hand is hearsay. Somebody tells you something you believe it. Not as easily as that but typically some elder told you something while you were young. So and so is the God, so and so is such and such is the right way, so on and so forth. You started believing that. That's it. No questions beyond that. Marx says this is the way political economic systems must be structured. Yeah, you go for it. So even if somebody is doing injustice to you, there are many, many ways of handling it. But no, whatever Marx said, that's the only way to handle that thing, dogma, hearsay. You have a book, it says God exists, right. Bible says God exists, so God exists. So you take Bible to be the proof of the existence of God. You take Quran to be the proof of existence of Allah. You take um, Gita uh, to be the proof of existence of Krishna. Well, that way. Spider-Man comics are the proof of existence of Spider-Man, isn't it? Knowledge converges, dogma diverges. So whether it's science or technology or any other kind of knowledge system, you try and arrive at one specific thing at which all can agree. And why do all agree at that point? Because there is sufficient evidence to agree on that. And pending the discovery of such existence, you might have differences, but over a period of time they are ironed out and through evidence. So, knowledge converges, dogma diverges. You have one religion and then you have further and further and further subdivisions within that religion. Every religion, every dogma, every system finds some way of diverging on some point or the other. And that oftentimes creates trouble. When divergence happens, 
without evidence. Nobody can actually prove their point because there is no evidence for anyone's point. What happens as a result? People get busy fighting on non-issues instead of using their brains and doing good stuff, good creative stuff, good innovation. Knowledge always has to be earned. Dogma almost always is a legacy. Knowledge often finds win-win situations. Dogma is mostly win-lose situation. I win, you lose. My dogma wins, your dogma loses. Another take on the win-win paradigm of knowledge and the win-lose paradigm of dogma. Knowledge is always a work in progress. Dogma is already perfected or so the dogmatists believe. And as we know, nothing in life can really be perfect. Knowledge allows you liberty of thought. In fact, it survives on that. Dogma sets limits to thinking. Knowledge pursues truth. Dogma follows tradition under the cover of pursuing truth. So let's, let's look at a specific um, truth or tradition. So December 25th is supposed to be the birthday of Jesus, presumably on 0 AD or some say 4 AD, but either which way, whatever was the official dogma, in fact, today, the Pope himself has begun to question it. Pope Benedict the 16th, that's the current Pope, Cardinal Ratzinger, wrote a book recently in which he gave evidence as to why we are celebrating Christmas or Jesus' birthday all wrong. And this is yet not official dogma. He has written the book almost in his personal capacity. The book has his name on that, not just the Pope. Well, so what is knowledge? What is truth? What is dogma? What is tradition? Knowledge pursues truth. Dogma actually follows tradition under the cover of pursuing truth. By the way, what's wrong with being wrong about Jesus's birthday? Well, what is wrong is that the seat of dogma, the, the people in charge of dogma, if they're wrong about such an important thing, what other things can they be not wrong about? Say for example, their whole opposition to condom usage has resulted in many deaths, many people contracting HIV AIDS in uh, Africa and dying. And still, you know, the Pope says, no, you cannot stop conception. You cannot use condoms. Doesn't matter if lots, lots of people are dying because of that. Similarly, their opposition to homosexuality. So, on the one hand, their stand makes a lot of extra births happen which means that the earth has to cater for ever more number of people but also the quality of life decreases and these are the smaller points in dogma what if they're wrong about 
these smaller points they are obviously wrong about the bigger points they are doubting their own correctness on the bigger matters like the Jesus's birthday knowledge is soaring to get closer to truth dogma is a boxed in shackled narrative knowledge is basically a fact based on facts dogma is basically an opinion based on opinions now this slide is probably the most important slide of this series why because it gives us the relationship between truth knowledge belief and dogma now what is truth truth is reality irrespective of belief we may or may not believe something it will still continue to exist in fact we may not even be able to understand it a large part of truth is indeed unknowable why is it unknowable because it is beyond the pale of our minds our minds which came about because of our needs to survive and succeed in a particular situation on a particular planet as we will see later in this part of the innovation series what we are able to perceive let alone conceive depends entirely on what we need to perceive in order to survive everything that we know is known through the mind and only a stupid person would expect that there is no reality beyond the mind if indeed even if i am a brain in a vat there has to be some real reality beyond this brain in a vat you know some other reality has to have put this brain in a vat and therefore this brain my brain i can never know beyond my vat so a large part of the truth is unknowable and i term it as absolute truth now of course because we have an experience of a life some part of the truth seems to be known to us because were it not so we couldn't exist we couldn't survive we couldn't perceive things we could know things so knowledge is that part of truth which is known to us plato defines it as justified true belief now of course not everybody agrees with Pla plato but then knowledge is that part of the truth which is evidential truth and that's the only real and knowable truth so in my terminology i call this objective or evidential truth and the one which is unknowable i call it absolute truth now outside of the circle of truth the circle which has truth and knowledge written in it there is another circle which is which i have labeled as belief this i consider unjustified belief that is this belief 
is not supported by truth is not supported by reality through evidence because evidence is the only evidence of truth only evidence of reality we can have but we can believe anything because minds have a tendency to, tendency to to go on any kinds of flights of fancy if we so allow them to and if we so desire them to so belief or unjustified belief really is of two kinds one is a personal belief something i believe or something you believe this uh, personal belief is essentially unorganized unjustified belief now if both of us start believing in that same thing and we organize it that unjustified belief into some kind of a body of belief then it becomes an organized unjustified belief such an organized unjustified belief is dogma so whether dogma or personal belief whether organized unjustified belief or unorganized unjustified belief both of these can be seen as subjective truths in other words basically what we believe to be true it is actually not true when we believe something to be true and it is actually true and it is supported essentially it is supported by evidence only then can we say that a belief is justified that's when it becomes objective truth or evidential truth and that really is the only knowable truth the area where the two circles of truth and belief intersect so this is the relationship between knowledge and dogma this is the relationship between truth knowledge personal belief and dogma knowledge demands love of truth dogma demands respect another key difference between knowledge and dogma is that knowledge is built using inductive logic while dogma is dependent upon deductive logic the basis of dogma is in some principles that have not been evidentially proved and are applied non rigorously using deductive logic to arrive at what can best be called doubtful conclusions on the other hand the basis of knowledge is in building it painstakingly through inductive logic you make some observations you note some pattern coming out of those observations you come up with a tentative hypothesis and then after repeated testing and checking and verification and all kinds of evidential tests you promote that to a theory theories subsequently may be modified or abandoned altogether so the fundamental difference is really that knowledge is built using inductive logic while dogma uses deductive logic now the key difference is that knowledge involves understanding understanding the explanations of a teacher or understanding the results of your experiments the key there is to listen to listen to your teachers or to listen to your experiments when you do that then you arrive at an understanding that understanding really is knowledge dogma is really memorization memorize 
all kinds of trivial facts, flights of fancy and you become better and better and better at your dogma. Knowledge involves creativity. Knowledge involves leadership. Dogma on the other hand is derivative. It's followership. Knowledge is experimenting. Dogma is faith. Knowledge is cosmopolitan. It belongs to everyone. Dogma is very limited, limited to the group that shares that dogma. Tribal, casteist, racist, jingoist, regionalist, whatever. Knowledge essentially is liberal. Dogma, more or less, is conservative. A dogmatic person values tradition over knowledge or understanding. A knowledgeable person cannot but be liberal in his approach or her approach. Knowledge is built bottom up. You use experimental technologies, informal participation and non institutionalized fora while dogma is top down it is normally pursued through institutionalized fora through formal participation and uses traditional technologies as it were finally the most important difference between knowledge and dogma in the arena of knowledge when you disagree you just disagree that's about it but when you're playing the game of dogma there normally is strife upon disagreement so look at the top right picture this is what happens when there is a disagreement between two dogmatic sides and one of them decides to use its power against the other. That man is asking for mercy from security forces in Gujarat in 2002. He succeeded in his plea. At the time of recording, I believe he is still alive. However, the children below that picture weren't quite so lucky. They were not able to beg for or succeed in getting mercy. They were killed and burnt and some were actually burnt alive. Now that happens whenever any powerful dogmatic force clashes with another powerful dogmatic force. You look at the picture at the bottom right hand corner. That is people who have been hanged in Iran. What is their crime? They stopped believing in the dogma of Islam. So just because you stop believing you become an apostate of Islam, you run a risk of being killed by the government if it's an Islamic, hardline Islamic government or sometimes by zealots of Islam in their own personal capacity. A regular occurrence in Muslim societies. Look at the middle column bottom that's when a different kind of dogma visits you. Those who believe in the message of Marx, they happily kill other innocent people who are just trying to earn their living. 
this is the lot of security jawans who were killed by naxalites both the sides having their own dogmas fighting each other killing each other the middle one is a still different kind of dogma this is from what is called as the bangladesh liberation war the pakistani army saw this as uh, what is that word they saw the bangladeshis as traitors and they thought it fit to kill them poor people indians see that as a war between india and pakistan bangladeshis see this as the losses they suffered in attaining their nationhood all because the various dogmas clashed with each other at the top in the middle column you see a child being buried in the aftermath of bhopal gas tragedy now is that a result of dogma probably it is probably it is not i would throw my lot in with that being a result of dogmatic thinking when you think that free market is everything when you think that industrialization is a must when you think that poverty is a disgrace when you think that you must keep increasing your population no matter what the resources are available to you that is the result of the dogma when you believe that you must industrialize even before you achieve the level of quality consciousness which is necessary for safely running pesticide plants that consciousness was not there in bhopal then that is not there in bhopal now we do not really attach much importance to quality but when it comes to life and death processes there has to be an adherence to quality otherwise lives will be lost now that's what happened there on to the leftmost column i don't have to explain that you can you've actually seen those cartoons earlier too i'm sure well that's what happens when you play on opposite sides in the arena of dogma that is probably the most sinister aspect of dogma and that is why i think it's necessary for all of us to educate ourselves on the harmful effects of dogma now this is a good flow chart of how knowledge is gained you ask a question you do background research you construct a hypothesis test with an experiment analyze results draw conclusion if the hypothesis comes out true through your results then you report those results and you've gained some evidential knowledge if however your hypothesis comes out to be false or only partially true then you think again you try again you modify your hypothesis or construct a fresh hypothesis you again test it with an experiment you again analyze results you again draw conclusions and if this time hypothesis comes out to be true this refreshed hypothesis comes out to be true then you report results and you say that you have gained evidential knowledge however if this time again your hypothesis comes out to be false or only partially true you again think you again try you again construct a fresh hypothesis or modify the hypothesis and you go through this 
iteration again and again and again until you come to a true hypothesis or you drop dead. That is the way you pursue knowledge. However, in dogmas arena, when you construct a hypothesis, you straight away jump to the conclusion that it's true and you start believing that you have reached a certain state of true knowledge. However, as you can see, unless you have gone through with the green and the sky blue ellipse and then concluded that hypothesis is true, you cannot say that you have arrived at true knowledge. So the process of no knowledge and dogma is somewhat similar. Both are intellectual disciplines, thus they are cousins. However, dogma makes a shortcut and that's why although some of what dogma says can be true, a lot of what it says is trash. Now, when this trash gets into a disagreement with another trash, you get violence, people die. One of the results of the rather lax discipline of the intellectual pursuit of dogma is that dogma confuses symbol with real. So there are some words which you see below that image. The words are Pratik, Yatharth, Chin, Truth, Evident, Real, Representation, Satya, Sign, Symbol. Now some of these some of these mean a symbol, some of these mean reality. So, if, if you look at the image, it says Allah created the universe. Well, let's try and separate knowledge from dogma here. Let's try and separate symbol from real. Well, Allah created universe. Really? Where is the evidence? And even if we are willing to disregard that part, who created Allah? All you are doing is pushing your problem one step. Instead of saying that all complications sit in the universe, you say, no, universe was created by X and now all complications sit in X and you cannot address those complications because X is holy, X is sacred, X cannot be questioned, X cannot be studied. Well, all you have done is pushed all the difficult questions in a sanctum sanctorum which cannot be approached. That is no way to learn anything, that is no way to knowledge. That is what dogma does. So, you look at what is the words which relate with symbol, pratik, chin, sign, symbol, representation, truth, what is real, the words that represent, that are real, that mean real are truth, evident, yatharth, real, satya. Now, you will see more such examples in everyday life. Let's just quickly look at a few more and then we'll move on. How else does dogma confuse symbol with real? You see on to the left when you look at Saraswati as a representation of knowledge 
then she is a representation of knowledge. She is the pratik, a chin, a symbol, a sign. On the other hand, when you start investing her with a concreteness, with a reality, with a personality, when you said, say that the symbol is real, that's when the problem comes in because that's when you pray to Saraswati. Now praying to Saraswati is not going to give you knowledge. You are going to give you, get knowledge only by following the path shown by Saraswati, by knowledge herself. You are not going to gain knowledge by, by praying to her, right? We must learn to treat symbol as a symbol, not treat a symbol as real. Or else we should just pray to Anna Devata and not earn a living and we should just pray to Kameshwari and not make love to get children or otherwise. Now the clash of dogmas. Now the result of dogma confusing symbol with real. In Dhar you have a structure that is considered a mosque by Muslims and a temple by Hindus. Interestingly, a mosque is supposed to be the place where you pray to Allah. Allah really has certain qualities. One of the primary qualities that Allah has is Haq, which means truth or which means reality. Saraswati is the goddess of knowledge and knowledge as we have seen is truth so it's real so essentially Allah and Saraswati both stand for reality but what's happening here a set of people hate another set of people because each of them thinks that the other has usurped what is their property. A Hindu thinks Allah is only a symbol but Saraswati is real. Muslim on the other hand thinks that Saraswati is only a symbol but Allah is real. While both of them Allah and Saraswati are symbols, only symbols that represent reality. Both of them are symbols and both of them represent reality. That's a problem with treating symbols as real. The only real thing which you get there is strife. And interestingly, it is the agents of this strife that we consider sacred. It is the people who stand up and scream about dogmas, various kinds of dogmas and hate the other dogmatists. We consider them holy personages. Strange. Allah as in a representation of reality is holy because reality is holy. Not because Allah is holy. Saraswati is holy because she is a symbol of reality and reality is holy. In herself, Saraswati and Allah are just symbols. The followers of those symbols are dogmatists who confuse symbol with real and are willing to kill the others or at least hurt the others or at the very least run down the others because they are both Ekantavadis. And why are they Ekantavadis? Because they confuse symbol with real and the rest of us sit back and give respect to all of them. 
all these people who confuse symbols with real and who make strife visit us really strange of us to allow them to do that money is an innovation which allows us to buy food among other things money is essentially the symbol the representation of the real stuff that you can get from it do you actually eat money eat dollar notes and rupee notes notes do you put them in between a bun and eat it and call it a burger no you don't do that you actually want the real burger then why is it that when it comes to other matters we allow dogmatists to fool us if we are willing to fight over symbols then we might as well run our lives only on symbols why do we go for reality then if we have to lay down our lives for the strife which is created by various dogmatists we and they must then eat rupees and not burgers if symbol has to be treated as real then it's perfectly fine to fight over allah and saraswati over mosque and temple however if only real is real and we want to eat only real then let us stop getting lost in the symbols and let us start moving towards the reality that is the only option we have recall that you saw this painting in part 1 but it's important to note that if no change in reality can change your belief then your belief is not based on anything in reality well the scientific method involves looking at the facts and then drawing conclusions from them however in the us you have a strong movement which is called the creationist movement in that movement you believe that the earth is only 6000 years old while evidence suggests that it's much 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 older than that now why that magic figure of 6000 because that's what certain in interpretations of bible say when bible is taken as reality then earth can only be 6000 years old so that's the conclusion that you have and then you start looking at what facts can support that the same is true of all those people who start who insist upon looking at scientific knowledge inside quran or vedas now there are some very good things in bible in quran and some very 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 brilliant things in some parts of the vedas however is that the way to go about it we must always support knowledge and never dogma finally we must recognize that we become good at what we focus on so if we focus on dogma 
we become more dogmatic. We focus on being blind, we become more blind. However, if we focus on knowledge, we become more knowledgeable. If we focus on learning more, knowing more, understanding our world more, then, then that's what we gain. Edison said, I haven't failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. It is said that he failed 10,000 times in trying to design an incandescent bulb. B a bulb that rev revolutionized our lives. Today, we cannot live without indoor lighting and without lighting our nights. But Edison failed 10,000 times before he found a way that it worked. His stand was, no, I haven't failed 10,000 times. I have only succeeded in finding 10,000 ways that it won't work. Therefore, you focus on knowledge and innovation, you become more knowledgeable and more innovative. Edison is supposed to have invented the most stuff. However, if you focus on dogma, you become more dogmatic. You kill each other and both the sides really, the say, really say the same damn thing. Both sides say, just doing the work of the Almighty. And they go on killing each other, hurting each other. And it isn't just that they're going to hurt each other. They also hurt so many other innocent bystanders who are not interested in that strife between the two dogmas. So unless we the bystanders get together and tell the dogmatists that if they have to fight, they have to do it in their own space, in their own time, with their own lives, not with ours. No, that's important. And we can say that only when we become good at knowledge, at understanding, at knowing reality, at gaining more evidential truth or knowledge about it. Now, let's just go into a little bit more detail about how we actually do become good at what we focus on. One of the things which the dogmatists really shout out from the rooftops is that if it weren't for a creator, how could such a complex thing as an eye come about? Now, there is sufficient amount of evidential proof which is available for that but they wouldn't look for it. They wouldn't agree with it. They wouldn't agree with the evolutionary proof. However, let's just look at something which is there in front of our eyes every day. Some see more vibrant colors than others. So let's just look at some facts about chromaticity. Something which will tell us that actually if you focus on something, if you work towards it, you achieve it, you succeed at it and you become better at that which you are focusing on. So a few slides on chromaticity and then we are going to wind up this presentation. Now. There are many species, many animals that are monochromats. In other words, they see only one color. So seals and walruses and sea lions and dolphins and porpoises and whales, all these have only L cones. That is the long wavelength cones. These are sensitive mainly from red to green. So these are the colors or rather this is the only kind of color they are able to see because there is nothing 
to balance uh, or, or to mix one color with the other. So they don't see like red and green, they just see one color. They see varying intensities of that. Now each cone and I'm talking about uh, an average loose understanding of this fact gives something like a uh, hundred different in intensities of a color. So they'll kind of see a hundred colors, the same color in different intensities. Um, there's a monkey moving on to the to the lower row. There's a monkey called owl monkey or night monkey. It's a new world monkey. In other words, it lives in the Americas. It is tending towards monochromacy. Why is it doing that? Because um, monkeys are typically trichromats. They can see three colors. Uh, or rather, they have three kinds of color sensing cones within their eyeballs. So they have three different independent channels. But this owl monkey really doesn't use that color discrimination so much. Why? Because it uh, lives almost entirely during night. Its feeding is in night. Now when it does so, it doesn't really need so many colors. What it really needs is how quickly uh, it can see a moving insect and catch it in midair and be able to feed itself. Those animals which are better able to feed themselves are able to better live longer, are able to live longer and thereby pass on their genes and those genes tend to then become standard in the species as it continues through several generations. We have seen the same thing happening in seals and dolphins and whales because they live in a completely blue-white kind of landscape. What they don't need is so many different vi uh, vibrant colors but they must be able to locate their prey or sometimes their predator easily. They need only one color. Therefore, they focus only on one color. Therefore, they have developed only those one color cones, only one color channel. The rest of it has kind of got whittled away over generations. So monochromats. Most placental animals are dichromats. In other words, they have only two color channels, only two independent color channels. What does that mean? That means that they have two different kind of cones within their eyes. One kind of cones is focused on a specific wavelength in the visible spectrum while the other one is focused on a different wavelength. Each of these channels, each of these cones can sense intensities at 100 different levels. Therefore 100 into 100 these animals can actually see 10,000 colors. Which are these animals? All placental animals. In other words, basically all the mammals and stuff. Includes your elephants and cats and dogs and um, cheetahs and antelopes and stuff. Now, why don't they need more colors? Because they need to be able to see movement better than they need to see more colors. Their survival is more dependent on identifying, observing, locating movement. So if a cheetah 
is better at locating a, an antelope which is slowly moving around then he's likely to be better fed likely to live a longer life likely to leave more offspring than another cheetah that is not so able to see movement not able to see it as well as cheetah number one similarly if there are two antelopes and one can see the cheetah moving towards them he or she will get a head start in running the other one will likely get eaten and will not be able to pass on its genes to its offspring so seeing more colors not of great use 10,000 is good enough for them two color channels good enough for them however they need to have more rods which will show you movement of objects so dichromats they become good at seeing two colors or in two color channels or in two color combinations because that's what they focus on because that's what they need in their lives trichromats now why did this boy and then monkey develop three color vision or in other words actually three different kinds of cones which are focused on three different wavelengths within the visible spectrum because plants produce fruits as a fee for vicarious reproductive mobility services provided by frugivores what i mean by that is plants typically produce fruit so that some animal which actually moves around from one place to the other can eat that fruit receive nutrition receive sugars and all the other good things that are required for life along with the fruit they are also likely to eat the seed which when they move around go to a new place wake up in a different place the next morning they are going to defecate there and they're going to deposit the seed along with some necessary manure so that the seed can grow and take root in that new place so essentially what the fruit is doing is improving its chance of reproductive success by giving this fee to the animals that eat or like fruits now man shares its ancestors with other monkeys and apes these ancestors were living in the trees they were subsisting on fruits they were frugivores now if you see green and red as the same color you're not likely to locate a yellow or an orange or a red fruit and you're gonna see them the same color as leaves somebody else who is a who has the third channel who is able to see the yellows and the oranges and the reds will readily see the ripe fruits because as per strategy the plants change the color of the fruit only when the seed is ready when the seed is not ready to germinate when the seed is not yet mature they don't want to lose the fruit so they try their very best that the fruit doesn't taste different from their leaves it doesn't look different than their leaves and it doesn't give any additional nutrition compared to their leaves so the outer signal is basically the color the color and the texture so that's how the frugivores and the fruits in tandem with each other developed this technique so a frugivore that has three good working color channels is better able to survive and pass on his genes three color channels again 100 into 100 into 100 so this boy sees a million colors three primary colors a million total colors three independent channels now for men and monkeys three colors are good enough they become good at seeing three colors because they focus on those why do they focus on those because they improve their chances of survival and reproduction which in other words 
is really immortality. Again, survival. Survival of the genes. Now, some need more than three colors. A bird that catches prey on the ground needs to see traces of its prey on the ground. The urine and feces of mice are visible in the ultraviolet range. So this bird can actually see in the ultraviolet range. You will notice that even we humans try to use that particular fact. So when you pass through the immigration, the police officer sitting there inspects your passport in ultraviolet light because if something funny has been done on the passport then those solutions and stuff that were used are likely to leave a telltale trace which is not visible to naked eye which is not visible in the visible light range but is it's visible in the ultraviolet range similarly insects most of them are tetrachromats why because ultraviolet like light makes patterns on flowers helping honeybees for example distinguish these flowers from others that to the human eye may look much the same so the flowers look much much more beautiful to bees than they do to us beauty lies in the eye of the beholder there's an old saying in persian which goes like laila ra bachashme majnu bayad deed laila must be seen through the eyes of the majnu a beloved must be seen with the eye of the lover so what you focus on you become good at you need four colors you need four channels you focus on those you become good at those just like if you focus on knowledge you become good at knowledge you focus on dogma you become good at dogma you focus on movement and not on colors you become good at movement like a cheetah is or like a seal or a porpoise is you focus on colors you become good at locating colors maybe not so much the movement but you become really good at locating colors like a monkey does like an ape does similarly tetrachromats finally pentachromats possible five or more independent color channels so at four channels we were already on 100 million colors right somebody who has five independent channels for color would actually see 100 to the power 5 in other words they would be able to see 10 billion different colors and while some some of these living beings there do that you must be wondering why the woman is there interesting the women are not you know more than trichromats generally speaking but human chromacy genes sit on the X chromosome and as we know men have only one X chromosome women have two X chromosomes so if the color channels because of the X chromosome from one bequeathment that is from father is focused on one set of wavelengths and the other legacy from the mother is on different wavelengths then a woman could theoretically see through six different independent color channels though they will not be so independent they will not still be able to see ultraviolet light but within the color range they'll be able to see a lot more colors 
and that explains while I can just talk about red blue and green and I kind of at the most get to like pink but I kind of you know stop there and all my women friends and relatives they are able to name so many different colors that also explains why women can dress up partly explains why women can dress up in such beautiful colors moving on from the colorful celebration of womanhood let's get back to why we actually went to chromacy because we wanted to see we wanted to look at evidential proof that we become good at what we focus on if we focus on knowledge we become more knowledgeable if we focus on evidence on facts on what we have achieved in the arena of knowledge and implementation of knowledge then we become like Edison we become like Einstein we become like the Buddha we become like Veda Vyas presuming that he wrote Gita however if we focus only on dogma then we become strife mongerers we become like those people who take the messages of brilliant knowledge seekers and use those as excuses to create dogmas and hurt other people it's important to know that our lives can only be successful that the human species can only survive if it focuses on knowledge and it defocuses dogma if we focus on knowledge we will become knowledgeable we will become innovative if we don't if we focus dogma we will become dogmatic and then we will call innovation bad we will translate innovation as bida and not as nudrat this is a key turning for the human civilization if we think correctly if we focus correctly human civilization will go from success to success because success lies only in knowing reality unless we know reality we cannot follow the path of success that is shown by reality focus knowledge defocus dogma to wind up a quick quote from Steve Jobs your time is limited so don't waste it living someone else's life don't be trapped by dogma which is living with the results of other people's thinking don't let the noise of others opinions drown out your own inner voice and most important have the courage to follow your heart and intuition they as in the heart and intuition somehow already know what you truly want to become everything else is secondary a related quote from Mahatma Gandhi be the change you wish to see if you wish to see more strife then become more dogmatic if you wish to see more success become more knowledgeable beware of dogma she's one hell of a bitch that concludes the part two of the innovation series the one that dealt with knowledge and dogma we try to understand why we fail to innovate sometimes we studied some more definitions 
And then we went on to what I believe is the primary enemy of innovation, that is dogma. We tried to see how knowledge and dogma are different. And that's what we conclude on today. This part two of innovation series. Well, thanks for watching through till the end. And uh, just before I say goodbye, a few points. Uh, one, I made a mistake by saying chromaticity in place of chromacy uh, when I was narrating a slide, among many other grammatical mistakes. So apologies for those. I was not able to include all the points of knowledge versus dogma, uh, you know, the differences because I thought it was already pretty long. And even the points which I included in the chart, I couldn't put slides on all the points, uh, but that's okay. It was already a bit too long, so that's fine. Um, next, oh yes, current Pope. That's the Pope uh, for the next several hours is still Pope Benedict the 16th. Uh, he leaves office on February 28th, 8 p.m. Vatican City time. And uh, in one of the slides, when I mention Pope, I'm talking about him, who will now on, that is from March 1st onwards, will be Pope Emeritus, still Benedict the 16th, and who was born, Joseph Ratzinger. Part 2 presented the hypothesis that the modern resident Indian's failure at innovation in the recent past has something to do with our confusing the two related intellectual disciplines of knowledge and dogma. Knowledge here is seen as an evidential model of reality and dogma as an unfortunate or lazy thinker's shortcut to it which sometimes shows the way but often misleads. Uh, this part went into substantial detail of how dogma can be differentiated from knowledge and the negative consequences of turning our face away from reality. This is the how not and what if not of innovation. And now, until next time, when I present to you part three of the innovation series, Visions and Case Study, goodbye.